Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Stuart Easton from Transparent Choice. Um, I'm one of the founders and the CEO here. And one of the things that, uh, uh, that we often do that I, I really enjoy doing is hosting sessions like this, where we have a guest speaker um, uh, who uh, agrees to share their hard-won wisdom uh, with the rest of us. Um, and uh, so uh, today we're lucky to have PMO Joe. Yay! Round of applause for PMO Joe. Uh, so, so Joe Push is, is PMO Joe, right? But on his more serious side, uh, the PMO Global Alliance named Joe one of the top 15 PMO influencers last year, right? So that's, that's kind of a big deal. It's one of the reasons we've had him here. We, we've had Joe here before. He's, really, he's been very generous sharing his knowledge and, um, uh, and occasionally we, we come on the radio show, right, Joe? Absolutely. We've, uh, we've got you coming up in April, so looking forward to that also. We do indeed. So, uh, so that's always good fun. Now, Joe not only is a, you know, a speaker and an influencer, he also runs the PMO Squad, uh, with, uh, which is uh, a US-based PMO consulting organization. They help really get things going. Oh, right. Excellent. We've even got a little bio here. Uh, <laughs> Got a visual, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's, it's very good. I like that. I like that. Um, as you can see, he's also the host of Project Management uh, Office Hours, right? Project Management Space Office Hours. So it's the Office Hours for Project Management, which is, um, which is a, a radio show, podcast, uh, and he gets really interesting people in there. That's, that's the one that we're going to do. Uh, one of the other things that Joe does is he co-founded the Veteran, let's see if I get this right, Joe, the Veterans Project Management Mentoring Alliance, right? Yes. Um, in, yeah. For, in oh, the it's, it's on the shirt. There it is. Yeah. Um, and we, 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 you know, we, we kind of rung a little bit in to support that, that cause last year. Do you want to take a minute and just talk about that, Joe, just for 10 seconds? Because that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. Um, so, we, you know, every country has their military and veterans... Uh, when they get out, often struggle to get a civilian-based job. And what we found is they're really well-equipped to become project managers, right? A, a mission in the military similar to a project, but they don't understand the civilian terminology and civilian certification. So we're a nonprofit organization that helps them with that transition. Uh, how to get from military career to civilian project manager. And that's epic, because often when you combine you combine those skills, that discipline with the, the, the civvy skills, you just get phenomenal talent. Right? Absolutely. It's, it's fantastic when it happens. So, you know, we like that. We support that where we can. Um, Joe's also, you know, as I mentioned, um, uh, he's kind of plugged in and, a, and a, uh, well known within the PMO Global Alliance uh, and the PMO Global Survey as well. And I suspect we're going to be hearing a little bit about that later on, uh, you know, some, some data from that. So I don't want to big it up too much, otherwise his head's going to fill the entire screen. <laughs> it's halfway there now, right? On the... <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, leadership. And, um, you know, jo Joe's presented some great slides, but I have warned him that, you know, you come on with me, you're never going to get through the slides in a linear fashion. So it's, there's going to be some interruptions, a little bit of fun on the way. But, but leadership is something that is so important and it's so often forgotten right we, we have certifications for for project execution and for you know, all these different disciplines but where's you know where's the leadership piece come in where does that come in so that's what we're going to talk about today um, I hope you enjoy it and with that I'm going to hand it over to Joe and uh, let's go yeah awesome so glad to be here um, and let's just jump into it because for me that's it's my style. Um, so what are we going to do? First of all, why does PMO leadership matter, right? Why is this talk going to matter? Then we'll look at what do we know? The global survey, Stuart mentioned, we'll, we'll get some data out of there, plus other uh, data points that we've uh, researched from within the industry. I, hopefully we come up and point out that there's a problem, right? So then we, we need to fix that. And then what would be some of the tools to help us get there? So, you know, being honest, we aren't very good as an industry. Uh, if we look at pulse of the profession trend data, we look at different survey results, KPMN, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, all of them, 
you know, there's this, we're about 50% success on projects. And we invest as an industry billions of dollars into projects every year. So for me, a coin flip isn't good enough, right? I'm not satisfied being in an industry where it's acceptable to be 50%. So to me, the data isn't one year. It isn't based on one study. It isn't from one country or one industry or one size organization. It's all organizations. And we have outliers who are good and we'll talk about them. But the, re the reality is for our industry, we have a long history of being mediocre. And with my personality, that's not acceptable, right? I grew up an athlete. You, you, you didn't try to almost win the game, right? You, you tried to win the game. The goal is to be better, is to improve, to keep getting better. And we're not getting better. Uh, this one down here, this, this price PwC um, study, in the US alone, we wasted to 150 billion dollars in revenue and productivity because of failed projects. What a tremendous drag on an industry or all industries, especially in a pandemic where there's already a drag. So we have to figure out how to get better. There's been some research on why projects fail, why PMOs fail. Uh, this one is one of my favorite studies. Ori Shibi had done that and he list 12 items why PMOs fail. And they're probably good. I've talked to this, the last one I did with you, Stuart, I think I used this slide as well. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all right, right? We mismanage stakeholder expectations. We have lack of senior levels, right? Yes, 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 yes. But that's the surface. We need to dig deeper in every one of these items I can contribute to and say, if we had better leadership in the PMO, we could overcome each of these. Inexperienced PMO staff, well, better PMO leadership would overcome that. Lack of senior level support, well, a better leader would go help cure that. Poor capacity management and organizational alignment, leadership. I mean, every one of these items is leadership, but what's not called out Leadership, we yes. don't call out the fact that we don't lead well. So for me, as we go through PMO Global Alliance or the PMO Squad or the PMO Leader, all the different organizations around the world, we always focused on the individual. We wanna make sure that we get better at project management. So PMI and all the different other organizations out there We've, we keep these metrics. We're now over 1 million PMPs. Okay, so what? We're still 50% success rate on projects, <laughs> right? Does it, does it matter how many PMPs we have or Prince2, Scrum, Safe? Everybody is investing in the individual. We're individually getting certified. We have organizations out there certain more certifying bodies, right? Axelos, universities now have degree programs, right? When, when I went to college, there were no degrees in project management. I didn't even know project management existed as a profession back when I was in college. Joe, it didn't. I mean, people hadn't invented the wheel when you were back in college. <laughs> well, maybe the wheel, yes. Fire, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, you know, but so, so I tell you what. So I mean, this is this is really interesting. But it, do, can you define leadership for me, right? In this context, what does that even mean? Well, the way I look at this again, I talked about. For me, sports was a big part of my youth. So if maybe you weren't sports, maybe you were into music or or some of the arts. Somewhere along the way, you were in a team, right? And to me, a PMO is a team. Somebody has to lead the team, the coach, the manager, the orchestra conductor, the choir director, the dance instructor, whoever it may be. They led the team to try to improve and become successful, whether it was an individual event, the concert, or, or the sporting event. And the PMO, that person running the PMO is our leadership. So how well do we manage our team? How well do we build work with our budget? 
How well do we interact with our peers? Where do we, where do we interact with our peers? How are we able to influence the organization to spend budget and make decisions? It's not the actual execution of the project. You, you certainly need leadership on the project team, but this is one step higher, right? This is at the, the organizational level over the entire PMO. That's the leadership we're talking about. So where, do it, so again, it's not just people too. We invest in technology. It's amazing what's happening in our industry where, where money is being spent to be able to give us better tools. Right? We're going to train the people. We're going to give them the best tools. And what's our results? 50%, right? It's mediocrity. So, I mean, this is, we're looking at $5.7 billion in the PPM market by 2027, right? We just saw earlier this year, PlanView acquired ChangePoint and Clarizen, right? There's some consolidation. Every um, individual that's out there that's the next Nostradamus who, who predicts each year what the trends will be in our industry says AI is coming, right? More technology to help us run our projects better. And that would be great, right? But if we run our projects better, it's kind of like having, again, a, a baseball is my sport. If, if we have great baseball players, but a horrible coach, we're still going to lose games because we don't have somebody leading us to perform better. We're going to win some games just based on talent. So we're going to be about 50-50, right? Some of our projects will work because we have talented people. But I want to get up to 80 or 90% success on projects. And to do that, we need to be able to get leadership involved to ensure that we're getting those really talented individuals to be able to utilize the investment in technology in a way that makes sense to help the organization deliver value and be successful. So, so here's, a, here's an analogy, right? So my, my brother plays for the Halle Orchestra uh, up in Manchester here in the UK. So the Halle is one of the world's premier classical orchestras. And you know, when they've got a good conductor, they are phenomenal, right? It's just incredible. Yeah. But, but when they have a bad conductor, yeah, they're still good. I mean, these are, these are some of the best musicians in the world, right? They can, right. They can keep it together. But it's, it's a very different experience. And it's a very different... What, what I find interesting is that it's a different experience from the listener's point of view. But it's a really different experience from the player's point of view as well, right? Where, where they're missing that sense of mission and cohesiveness. So as individuals, you know, a conductor can't teach my brother anything about how to play the tuba, right? But what he does is he brings everybody together so that everybody's going in the same direction and, and removes the bottlenecks that's stopping them doing that. So, yeah. uh, I, you know, and I think that's a, a really nice kind of analogy for what you were just saying. And those talented individuals on a team become frustrated and want to look for a new team when they see that the team's not performing up to the capabilities and, and we constantly get turnover, right? Depending on the research, you know, some people think PMOs last for three years, others challenge that, and I'm not here to support it one way or the other, but I'll certainly support that PMOs, right? Being the head of the PMO squad, we help organizations deliver and improve on their PMOs. And what we find is that everybody out there has a problem. We, I have not found the perfect PMO yet. I don't know if one exists. I don't even know what I guess what a perfect PMO would be. But I'm a judge in the PMO Global Awards as well from the PMO Global Alliance. And every year as we go through that competition and we evaluate the PMOs, they're doing a lot of great work. They're doing a lot of great things. But there's a journey. And they all start out learning lessons and not performing well and eventually getting better. And you can see in all of them, the ones that are successful have a really strong leader at top. The ones who don't uh, have success in that competition, generally they have a lot of turnover on the top. They don't have consistency. And even though they've got good process in place, they still can't deliver as an organization. Interesting. So I think we've got a problem, right? I mean, 50% success, just not good enough. An orchestra with a bad tuba or a good tuba doesn't sound good, right? I want to hear everybody working together to see what success looks like. So we've got data on this, right? What do we know? 
if we look at pulse of the profession, every year PMI puts this out. Um, I look at this as, as results, leadership matters, right? Every year they do this survey, they always come back with the number one driver of project success is engaged ex executive sponsorship. Year over year, it's the same answer. And again, executive sponsorship equals leadership, right? An executive sponsor is the project leader. It's the person who, who owns the project. The project manager is driving the execution for it, but it's the project sponsor's project, right? The leader over that project. When that person is engaged, succeed, right? We have data evidence that shows better leadership at the top gives us better results. Now that's not over the PMO, right? It's, it's certainly on the project, but we can translate that over to PMO success. And maturity matters. We find organizations that they call, or PMI calls them champions, right? Organizations who do this well versus underperformers. Project success rates are 92 to 32 for champions versus underperformers. I don't know why every company in the world doesn't look at that result and say, how do we become a champion? How can we invest to get a 92% success rate? I don't understand why organizations ignore that. Oh, actually, I do understand why. Because there's not a PMO leader telling the executives in the organization that that's the data. We invest in improving the efficiency of our manufacturing line. We invest in the tools for our marketing department to ensure that they have the best tools. We give the sales team every tool they need because they have leaders driving those discussions at the executive level of how we can make improvements in the bottom line of our company and the PMO is not there, right? The PMO is sub, it's a sub function within the organization. But all of the data points to this, right? If we look at waste, 1.4% of every dollar wasted on a project. That's not bad, right? A 1.4% waste. But those underperformers, it's 29% waste. I mean, all of the data is strongly supporting that when we have leadership and when we have maturity, we succeed. And leadership and, mat and maturity at the project level equates up to the PMO level. So and how that, do we get and, and that particular research was really interesting, Joe, because one of the conclusions from it was around um, uh, managing at the portfolio level, right? Which is kind of a, a slightly different way of thinking about leadership, right? And it, you know, it's about getting out of the weeds of what are the details of this project or this step of the methodology, whatever it may be. And it's about thinking a little bit more strategically. It's about thinking like a leader. It's about thinking about what are we here for? What's the business intent? And then making sure that the projects you're doing line up and that you've got the right resources in place and so on and so forth. So, so you know, it's, it, you're absolutely right. It's about leadership and, and a big part of that is stepping up and thinking and acting at the portfolio level as well. I mean, did you, because uh, one, one of the things, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in, here's a zinger for you, let's get a bit con controversial now. So, so one of the things that I get worried about when I see a PMO leader is someone that's come up and grown up as a project manager who then transitions into a PMO role. Yeah. So if, some, if somebody comes from leading a business unit and they come into a PMO role, I have no problem because they're, they're going to learn PMO language. They're going to learn about the methodologies and all the rest of it, but they already know how to lead. Um, so do you have any thoughts on kind of that, that transition from? Yeah, you know? Absolutely. And we had in a couple of slides, I have data from the PMO global survey that will support that, right? That, that's, yeah. that's what's happening. Um, you know, the reality is leadership often is, should we even work on the project? Right. When we have engaged sponsors, usually it's because they have a strong interest in the outcome of that result. Right. They're at the executive level. We have a strategic decision that we're going to go implement a new CRM system, perhaps. And, and I know this is an IT bent as opposed to project management in general. But they're doing the CRM system not to implement a new CRM system. Right. It's to drive an increase in sales. 
right? That's the business reason why they're doing that. And the chief sales officer, right? The senior vice president of sales is highly engaged to drive that because he or she has bonus tied to that. Their outcomes are driven to that. So they want to see that project be successful. So they drive that project with the project leader and they have leadership to get rid of obstacles and move barriers from their way. But if we don't have that engaged sponsor, it's there. Are we working on the right project? Those decisions have to come first, right? So we think about where, where does a, P, a PMO usually live in an organization? Again, this is where leadership comes into play. We have a CEO and we get the chief marketing officer, chief financial officer, the CIO, chief sales officer, right? All these chiefs are leaders. And think back into our own organizations and, and picture those chiefs, right? The C-suite organizations. They're all really senior leaders, 25 years plus experience, making strategic decisions to drive the organization. And then we bury the PMO underneath one of them. So there's a perception problem, right? Think back to when we were kids. You know, I don't, again, I don't know in the UK, I know we have global audience here, but for me, right, at all holidays and, and family events, there was the grown up table and there was the kids' table. And it, you, you waited for that day. Usually you turned 18 years old and you got to go sit up at the grown up table, right? Or maybe somebody couldn't attend that day and, and you got to sit at the grown up table, right? It meant something to be at the table with the, with the adults. The PMO is not at the table with the adults, we're at the kid table because we don't have leaders. And, and picture again, the CFO and the PMO leader. And just the contrast between them, right? 20, 25, 30, 40 years leadership in financial organizations around the world, they're the CFO of the organization driving how we manage our financial decisions. Part of those financial decisions is a portfolio of investment to go deliver projects. And we hand that off to a junior function with a junior leader and junior team members that are kids within the organization and not sitting at the big kid table or the grown up table. And we can't influence how we respond. So we're immediately disadvantaged just because of how we align our, our organizations. We have to be able to get up to that top row, right? We need to be able to find a way to be able to fit in to that C-suite. So, so Munir was sort of asking a question online in the background here, Joe, about, yeah. about that. And, and should we, should the, should it really be a chief project officer, right? Should it be a C-suite role? I think so, right? The, re the reality is that when we choose to work on the right projects at the right time, portfolio management, right? those right projects are strategic organizational decisions. So that's the C-suite making those decisions. Why aren't we letting that C-suite then ensure we're executing on those decisions, right? If, if executive sponsorship is so important that it ensures project success more than any other item, why are we devaluing the level of the PMO? Why are we not elevating them, right? bringing us up to that C-suite, whether it's a chief project officer, senior vice president, or whatever we wanna call that role. Well, I'm not big into labels. I'm more important into what's the meaning behind the label. And when we don't have somebody sitting at the, at the grown up table as an industry, we're immediately devalued, right? We have to be able to take their strategic decision and have the same value as them to be able to go deliver on those decisions. And right now, we don't have that within organizations around the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because the I, I was on a and Munir actually came back and and said something similar, right? That I was on a call the other day with a, a, a bunch of so it's a large organization. So under the CIO, COO, there are sort of four business groups, and there's IT that kind of runs horizontally across it all, and and so you have these four different people on the call, each of whom owned a different part of the IT portfolio. And when you say, what do you, you know, describe your role? What they answered was, I'm in IT. Right. Right. Wrong. We're not in IT. You're not in, you know, building services. We're not in, 
right? We're there to enact business change. And, and, and I think, you know, it's, it's very difficult to change that mindset if you are a service organization that's buried underneath a, a, a stovepipe. Right? Yeah. Just large organizations in particular, it's really difficult to get that big picture if you don't have a seat at the table. Uh, and, in and what are some of the trends we're seeing, right? We're seeing pop-up of the SRO, right? The Strategy Realization Office or the VMO, the Value Management Office. Why, why are those new functions, new titles, new roles popping up? Because they're a PMO, right? Let's call them what they are. Somebody said, hey, the PMO isn't working. Let's create a strategy realization office. What does that mean? A strategy realization, isn't that the entire company? The, a strategy realization function, right? But the PMO is the one that's supposed to be doing that, but organizations have devalued us, so they don't want to call it a PMO. Mm. Right? Well, we have this uphill climb. And, and with, I think in the industry, we've, we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot over the last couple of decades because, yeah. you know, if, if, you, if you put a post, I guarantee you, put a post out onto LinkedIn and just say, what is a PMO? And then just stand back and watch the comments explode, right? Because there's no common definition, there's no real understanding. And, you know, I mean, one of the, I'm a, I'm a little bit extreme on this one, perhaps, but, but as, as a general rule, I think if a PMO isn't acting strategically, it's not really a PMO. It's something else. It's something to do with reporting or methodology or something, right? But it's not really a PMO. The PMO is really about strategy and how do you then execute that effectively? So I think you're right. I think the, the all these new terms that are coming up are being invented to try and rebrand this thing that that just has a bad reputation because yeah. so many of them were set up as being these low level reporting offices you know project reporting offices not not um you know the the sort of strategic impact offices so so i think it, i think you're right it's the same it's what a pmo should be doing but too many hey. pmos don't do that yeah, I mean, last time I was with you, right, the PMO squad, we looked at all the research, we worked with organizations around the world, talked to our peers, and asked the question, what is a PMO? Yep. We got project management office, portfolio management office, program management office. And what we did is we rebranded that, right? We say within the PMO squad, when we work with our clients, it's purpose measure optimize, right? It's the purpose driven PMO. And Working with your executive team, your C-suite team, define the purpose. And if the purpose is execute strategy, then you measure how well are we executing strategy. And based on those results, you optimize your function to make sure you're achieving it, right? So it's this constant feedback loop of a PMO using terminology, purpose, measure, optimize is a strategy realization office. It is a value management office, right? We are the org organization that's supposed to ensure return on investment that we make, right? We have to provide value back to the organization and we'll never be able to do that consistently if we're a sub-function of some other organizational group. Just not gonna happen. Yeah, now we could keep going on this for a while, but I know you've got some good data to share. So let's-, let's Yeah, cool. So, so I, I mentioned uh, PMO Global Alliance. So I'm, I'm the managing director of the PMO Global Survey for the PMO Global Alliance. And last year we did our first survey, surveyed PMO leaders from around the world. And um, we'll go through some of the results of that. This is one survey. It's not meant to be all inclusive, right? It is uh, what it is. The first thing we asked was, have you ever been surveyed about PMO leadership and leaders before? 82% said no, right? We've never asked about PMO leadership before. We're always asking about project performance, certifications, right? We're not focused on leadership. So I think this is the key, right? It's the E, it's the part we've missed. It's been glossed over. We just give it uh, a second thought thinking, well, somebody's leading the PMO, so they must be good at it, right? Because they're in leadership. And if they're not, we'll just change. And then if they're not, we'll just change. And there's this constant turnover within the leadership level. 
this goes back to your point before, Stuart, right? What was your role before leading your first PMO? 81% of the people had no PMO leadership before running a PMO. And if we count consultants in the mix, or it's counting the consultants in there. Um, so when we look at this, we say, we have a really good project or program manager. He or she knocks it out of the park, right? They do a great job running projects. They've never really been promoted up to run a function where you have to manage budget, you have to manage performance reviews and people, you have to interact with other leaders and we promote them. Now, all of a sudden our team lost one of our, if not our best project delivery person, but one of the best. And we put them in a position where they have no experience, no training, no ability to, to lead in that team. I was one of them, right? I, I go back to my first PMO I ever led. I was working for Textron, better known for Cessna Aircraft, Bell Helicopter, Easy Go Golf Cars. And I won, uh, was in the finance uh, organization. I won Employee of the Year, right? We had just delivered a big project. And amazingly, project manager got recognized. Uh, and I got Employee of the Year in the entire company. I got put into a leadership program and Bell Helicopter had a, an opening for a PMO leader. I walk in and I ran that PMO like I was running a project. We had checklists for everything. I had team meetings. We had our stand-ups. We ran it just like a project and we were horrible, right? I failed miserably because I didn't know how to lead. Nobody came to me with leadership training to help me understand what we needed to do. And my boss, I remember my first performance review. I said, hey, Benny, how am I doing? I think I'm killing it, right? I'm doing awesome. Look at our audit scores. We're, we're compliant to our process. We've got schedules built for everything. Our resources are allocated great. And he said, Joe, the reality is the feedback I get from the business is the PMO stinks. We're not executing on the strategy. We're not delivering value to the organization. And I didn't even know what he was talking about. Right? I, I didn't have experience understanding that. So when we look at who's running PMOs, if we're putting junior inexperienced leaders into PMO roles, we're going to get that same sort of leadership deliver or performance from them. It's not a knock on them as individuals. It's have we prepared them to be leaders? So I, I had a story somewhere. I don't know where I heard it, but I heard a story somewhere about when they made the film, The Matrix, the, when they were casting it, they actually had a very long discussion and did, did a little bit of research and experimentation to figure out whether they should hire actors and teach them martial arts, or should they hire martial arts experts and teach them to act? Yeah. Right? And because, because that PMO role is really difficult if you've never done it before, because you have to both be able to do the martial arts of, of project management, right? You need to know that and, and know, it, know it pretty well, but you also have to be able to do the acting with the executive team, right? You have to be able to speak executees, right? You have to be able to speak business instead of speaking project when, you, when you're sitting at the, at the high table. If you want them to take seriously, don't walk in with a Gantt chart is the golden rule, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so you don't, you don't want to be speaking business, uh, speaking projectees to the, to, the, to the senior leadership. You want to be talking about business outcomes and roadblocks and things like that. Um, so, so, do you think it's easier to take Canal Reeves and teach him to, to do martial arts? Or do you think it's easier to take someone who's good at martial arts and teach them to act? In the PMO space, uh, give me a, a great leader. We'll teach him how to the project management part of this. I, I'd rather bring in, um, you know, the, the manager of the accounts payable department who's shown to be a great leader then bring my best project manager and, and promote them to be a, a PM, PMO leader. I think we weaken ourselves on two fronts when we do that, right? We take away our best project delivery person and we put them into a role where they've never had any success before. Now that's not to say that we're shutting the door on project delivery professionals becoming PMOs, right? Uh, because, because some of those people are exceptional leaders as well. Sure. And, and, and in fact, it may not be your best project manager who is the best leader. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. And that's what we have to look at. What does the training plan look like, right? We don't have in place 
<clears throat> excuse me, four p.m. for PMs. If we are going to stick at eighty-one percent, right? If we're going to keep it that that way, well, let's put a training program in place to get them ready when they're promoted. That's what's missing, right? Without that, I'll take the leader of another function all day long. If we can put the proper training in place, then I'd go with the PM person. But we don't have that today. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like an opportunity. Absolutely. And that's what the PMO squad does, right? We come in and work with PMO leaders or PMs and their teams to be able to put in the process, right? To be able to help them build the bench. Someone needs to be able to be next in line. We work with organizations to help them do that, right? And that's ultimately what we need to be doing, right? And this goes, here's another one. How much experience do you have leading a PMO? We've got some great results here, right? About 45% more than five years. So there's some good experience there. But more than half, right? 55%, it's been less than five years. And as with anything, right? You know, first time you learn to, to ride a horse, it doesn't go well. It takes a long time to be able to understand how to properly ride a horse, right? And to understand the gallop and when to pull on the reins and how, where to sit on your saddle. That sort of experience is important. Playing in an orchestra, you know, playing at home, you can be great as an individual performer, but learning how to fit in with your team as an orchestra player, right? Is important to know how you come together. That takes time, it takes experience to get there. And we're just very young in the PMO space, right? Again, we compare and contrast this to CFOs, chief sales officers, chief marketing officers. They're sitting there with 25 plus years experience. And we're sitting here at five or less, right? Until we change that gap, we're never going to be able to sit at the grown-up table, right? We're perceived to be one of the kids because we don't have the experience. We should be at that kid table. We have to learn how to build that pipeline to get us more experience. Cool. Just a quick time check, Joe. We've got about 20 minutes left. Yeah, we're looking good. Keep I think we're, I think we're, I think we're, I think we'll fit in here. Yeah. Um, and then this goes back to, you know, I built that org chart saying, Hey, without any data, this is what I, I see. But do we actually have data to support that we're a sub function? doesn't have to be underneath the CIO, it can be under, and underneath others. But the data says, yes, about 70%, over 70% don't report to the CEO. We're not in the C-suite. I'm staggered that anything remotely close to 30% does report to the CEO, if I'm honest. Yeah, and again, one survey, so maybe we got the right, right responders on this, but probably on the high side, but it's the data. Data's the data, we it's can data, use it any way we want. And I'm surprised it was only 11% into the CIO. I, I would have thought we, we would have had more. Mm -hmm. But um, the other disturbing thing is 12% don't even have a sponsor, right? They're sitting out there in the organization floating around um, and not having any executive support. How in the world will they ever be successful, right? They're not getting the mentorship or leadership from other executives. Um, if we think about those, right? When the PMO squad goes into the organization and we talk to the PMO leader, one of the first things we ask is, show me your executive reports. Show me your executive dashboards. In nine times out of 10, they, they pull out the, the project list with the red, amber, green, right, for cost, budget, and schedule. And I immediately know they're, they're going to fail. It's the worst executive report you could ever produce because an executive doesn't want to know how is each project going. Right, an executive wants to know how is your function performing? Right, imagine if we uh, ask the sales executive what his executive report looks like for the leader. He doesn't have a list of 150 deals they're working and whether or not those deals are gonna be successful. Right, he has, here are the deals we've won. We're on target for our, our quarterly metrics. Right, it's a completely level, different level of report. It's the grown up report. And we're producing the little kid table report because we have junior resources running a PMO reporting up what they think the executives want to see. Well, and, and I, I, I think the systems and methodologies don't help us here either. So, so, you know, I mean, those are the things when you, when you're learning to be a project manager, 
that's what you're told is important. That's how you manage your project is with these reports, right? So of course that's what you're going to bubble up. Okay. Um, and so this is this is what I was saying earlier about translating from projectees into business language. It's it's so important. And and the other the other thing is that most a lot of the PPM tools out there speak projectees as well, right? So we rely on the tools and 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 they're sold as as solving our governance and reporting problem. But actually, I would suggest a lot of them are exacerbating the reporting problem because they're making so much of this data available and easy, easily available that rather than thinking about what does the executive team need to see, we just take that report and go, Bleh. you know, it, it's kind of report puking on the on the executive table. And that's not cool, kids. Right. It, it's here, you figure it out. Here's yeah. the data you figured out. Instead of coming to them with, We've provided value to the organization this quarter by doing what? We don't produce those reports for them. We don't talk about effective utilization of organizational resources. We talk about projects are on time, projects are late, right? So the executives, we lose them because we're not talking their language, right? A true leader talks both languages, one language to my team, the second language talking up, right? Managing up. And we don't have that ability, as you mentioned, right? To translate our team language to executive language. Um, and part of that, again, I think is the maturity and experience thing, right? How long have you led the PMO in your current organization? Again, it's five years or less, right? These are small numbers. Before your current PMO, how many PMOs have you led? Over 60% is two or less, right? Again, how do you build that experience to be able to be an effective leader to talk to that seasoned 25 year old CFO, right? The, the CEO and the CFO are best friends, right? How, tell me how we're doing financially. We need to be able to be best friends with that CFO. We need to be able to show them what value we're providing back to the organization for the investment they made, right? CFO signs off and says, you can spend $10 million to go deliver that project. We need to be able to go back to that CFO and say, We've spent five million. We're a, we're now showing a return on investment starting to come in. It may take years to recover the the full investment, but we have to be able to show that that's where we're working towards investment discussions as opposed to just expense discussions. Totally with you. Different language. We have to be able to talk. Yeah. yeah. Here's the other one. When we were children, we were taught have a coach, get a coach. When we're parents of children, we tell them, learn from your coach. But when adults and adults interact, you can't have a coach. But for some reason, we think that when you become an adult, you no longer should receive coaching. I don't understand that. In, in professional sports, they all have a coach. In acting or the arts, music, they all have a coach. But in the business world, if you have a coach, what's wrong? How come you need a coach? There's, there's a perception that coaching is for people who don't uh, or aren't able to perform, right? They have a deficiency. They need to get coached. It, we're completely missing the boat. Everything that we teach our children and expect from our children is exactly correct. We just stop it when we get to be an adult. It's amazing to me, right? 80% don't have a coach, 62 thirds don't have a mentor. Where are we learning from as adults? Do we think just because you turn 30, all of a sudden you snap your fingers and you have knowledge, right? There's a, there's a generation that comes before us and we need to learn from them, right? They've made the mistakes we're about to make. They can help us avoid those mistakes. They can help us learn the executive language. They can help us learn how to create reporting. They can learn us how to work with team members or teach us how to, to work with team members. Those are the things we're missing within our leadership, within the PM. Again, these are PMO leaders who responded to this. This isn't a project manager. This isn't some other part of an organization. These are PMO leaders. And, you know, again, with the PMO squad, this is what we do. We help mentor and coach PMO team members and leaders to become successful and deliver for their organization. It's a complete gap we have in our profession. And again, all of our associations out there are focused on the individual. 
right? They're focused on get your PMP, get your Prince 2, get your Scrum certification. They're not saying, here's what you need to do to be an effective leader. So to me, this is one of the most important pieces of data that came out of the survey that we did with the PMO Global Alliance. And, and frankly, while you're doing that, don't just do that with the PMO leader. Do it with, do it with all your senior project managers, right? Be building the skill pool. You don't, you don't, um, uh, you know, if you, you used the sales met uh, metaphor earlier, right? In a sales organization, you don't take someone who's never done sales and give them your biggest accounts. You give them some junior accounts, some small accounts, and you let them make some mistakes and learn and, and you know, model behavior of people who've learned the lessons and all that kind of good stuff. So, so, you know, if, if you, if you're going to start to, I mean, these numbers are shocking, Joe. <laughs> uh, I mean, I am absolutely shocked. This is the first time I've seen these and, and I'm absolutely shocked by this. Um, so, so if you're going to mentor people, don't just pick one person, you know, the, the PMO leader and mentor them. Right. You got to build a bench. You got to build a skills um, by, tr by mentoring and training a number of people in the organization you build resilience, you, you enable better communication, you get people speaking the same language, using the same ideas and frameworks to move things along. Uh, but this is, wow, amazing. <laughs> I, I remember my first mentor I ever had, a gentleman named Terry Jones. I'm a junior level project manager and he's in the C-suite. And I go into the first, I go up into his office, you know, I'm so nervous, I go into his office, I sit down, and we're, we're just staring at each other, right? Nobody's saying anything. And then I'm kind of awkward in the silence. So I just start talking, right? And I'm talking and I'm talking and I'm talking and I'm talking. And eventually I'm like, I stopped and I said, don't you want to say something? And he said, I just wanted to listen to what you were going to say. Because as executives, it's important that you learn how to listen. It's the most important thing you're going to take as you elevate in your career. And that stayed with me now for, you know, 30 years, because I always thought if I talked the most, then people would listen to me. It's the reverse, right? It's if I listen more, I'll be able to speak with a better, with a bigger stick. That's learning executive behaviors as opposed to the junior behaviors, right? That's how a mentor can help you, right? He didn't say anything and taught me the biggest lesson of my career the first time I ever met him. And that's what we need to be able to do, to your point, with project managers and also with the PMO leaders. So how do we fix it, right? I think we got a problem, right? We got to fix this thing. <laughs> One, let's focus on leadership, right? All of this discussion is, is about that. Um, we, we have to, PMs and technology are important and we don't stop working on them, right? We continue that but we have to do a plus one. We have to add into this discussion within our industry, PMO leadership is important and what are we going to do? The other is we have to go sit at the grown-up table, right? If you are a leader in your organization today, build your plan of how you're going to get out from underneath whoever you're reporting to and get into the C-suite. As an industry, until we solve that problem, we're always gonna have this challenge. And, and right bottom. now, and, and right now, sorry to interrupt you, but right now, in the, in the aftermath of, of COVID, I'm sorry, we've got all the, we've got this far without mentioning it. So, you know, in the aftermath of COVID, right, there's the leadership team is really hoping that people are going to step up and help them fix problems, right? So this is this is the opportunity to earn your seat because you, you you have to earn that seat, right? So this is your opportunity to earn that seat by really coming in and, and you know, do, do, yeah, so the stuff that we do, project prioritization, being able to go into the room and give really clear investment information, investment level of information about, you know, what can we, what can we safely stop doing for now? What should we be doing more of, right? How, what's, what represents good value for money? What, what, what is not good value for money? And that kind of stuff, and really help the leadership team steer around the rocks Right, and, and by doing that, you're gonna earn trust. And when you, once you've got trust, they'll let you into the room, right? So at least you can wait on table, <laughs> on the high ta top table. And then well, once you've been doing that for a while, you know, maybe they'll just let you sit down right, and join in. So well, that, yeah, 
that's the third item, right? Deliver results. You have to be able to deliver on that. Take the learnings that you get from your mentor, your coach, from PMO squad, right? From transparent choice, from others within the industry to be able to change the discussion. When you start talking differently to them, they'll start listening, listening differently. They'll, they'll invite you to opportunities that you might not have been at before, right? If, if you're not getting results, they're not going to respect your ability to deliver at the next level, let alone at the current level where you're at, right? 50% success. Okay, well, why am I going to put, promote him to the C-suite? He or she hasn't done what they need to do to get that promotion. So you're right. You have to be able to deliver. Great. So, I'm going to, I'm going to remind you guys, because I'm in charge of reminding you guys to stop talking after a bit, that we've got uh, nine minutes left. Um, and and there's, a, there's a really interesting question um, sitting on the question, sitting on the on on on, on the Q and A, um, which I think would be great to address. And also, just a reminder to, to all the other participants, if they if they want to grill these guys, now's the the the, the chance to to send in a, a question. Um, but but to get started, it, it would be great. Um, uh, Munir has, has 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 asked a sort of follow up. Um, really. I guess thinking about the the product, the PM function, and 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 not just talking, we've talked a lot, obviously a lot about the individual um, and individuals' capabilities, but but how does the whole function um, become more elevated within an organization? Well, that, that to me again starts with leadership, right? If if you're not able to provide the value, the roadmap to the leadership team of where you're executing and, and the value you bring to the organization it's hard to get that, that elevated part within the organization. So to me, it's about building a plan to be able to get the tools, training, certification, coaching, discussions, right? I would suggest, first suggest, go to somebody in the C-suite and get them to be a mentor for you. Understand what it takes in your organization to become a C-suite member. And most likely, I'm making an overgeneralization here, but if you only have five years in, you're not going up to the C-suite next year, right? You're going to have to earn those chops. But maybe through the discussions with that C-suite member, you can influence up, right? There's Managing Up, great book mm -hmm. by Dana Brownlee, where you can bring to them the importance of the PMO. And maybe you don't get promoted, but maybe the PMO gets elevated and an appropriate leader gets put in place. And maybe you become a manager now to that C-suite member, right? Until the C-suite sees value in us, we'll never get to be able to go up there. So I would immediately go into the C-suite and look for somebody to interact with as a mentor and be able to help them see the importance while you're learning from them as well, you're helping to manage up within the organization. And, and a key thing to remember, I think, is that, you know, there's no such thing as a teleportation device. Right. If I want, if I want to get to the other side of town, I can't teleport to the other side of town. I have to decide that the other side of town is where I want to be, and then I have to start walking, one step at a time, to get there. And uh, it would, you know, which is kind of what you were saying, right, Joe? You know, Absolutely. Start, yeah. You know, pick pick a step, get a get a mentor, and just start the journey and earn that earn that seat at the table. Um, and and I think just just sort of. Wishing that we had a seat at the table isn't going to get you there. Uh, being frustrated that we don't have a seat at the table isn't going to get you there. It's 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 what we do, and it's it's what how we interact, it's how we present. You know, it's everything that Joe's been talking about today. Is is how you get there. Nobody owes us a seat at the table. Yeah, and and don't be afraid to you know again bring in a group like the PMO Squad. Uh, bring in an organization that's an external influence, right? Executives love bringing in external experts to help you, right, in one of your roles, be successful. Leverage them to use your, to build your own success. You don't have to do this on your own. There are organizations out there like ours that have done this successfully for others, so we can help you on that path to help you get there. And to Stuart's point, this isn't Star Trek, we're not going to teleport somewhere. We've got to be able to have a plan of how to get there. So, so if somebody wants to reach out to you, Joe, how would they do that? Well, funny you should ask. Uh, <laughs> certainly, you know, in today's world, you know, LinkedIn is so popular in the business world. That's probably the easiest way, right? Just jump out to LinkedIn, do a search PMO Joe. Uh, you'll be able to connect with me. Um, 
you've got the, the different sites here that you can connect as well. The one thing I'll point out that's new within the industry that we're working with is the PMO Leader Global Community. This is a new site that's not tied to a specific methodology, framework, tool, person, individual, right? We are completely a platform for a community to build where PMO leaders can go and work together, right? We can provide, out there you have access to training, to coaches, consultants, speakers, blogs, books, authors, peer-to-peer uh, -peer discussion groups. It's a great opportunity to be able to interact with one another and not have the pressure of, well, I don't think your framework's right for me. We don't care about framework, right? PMO Global Alliance has a great framework. Uh, Lindsay and the House of PMO have a great framework. Laura Bernard, PMO Impact Engine, it's a great framework. The PMO squad has a great framework. All of them are great, but they're only theirs. What if theirs doesn't fit for you? What do you do next? So we have this new platform where all frameworks are welcome, where all interaction is welcome, where all discussions welcome. So I, I strongly recommend everybody go out to thepmoleader.com and see what's happening out there. It's a new site, so it's growing. It's not fully built out yet. Um, but we've got our big launch party coming up on April 2nd. We have a global advisory board, uh, Fatima Abuchi from Australia, Billy Moape from Zambia, Leo Torres from Spain. Uh, I'm on there representing in the U.S. And we have two open board spots uh, for the Middle East, Asia, India, Russia. Uh, we're looking for women to fill those spots as well if they're interested. Cool. Excellent. Thank you for that, Joe. And, and thank you, as ever, for a, a very thought-provoking session. Uh, yeah, quick round of applause for, for Joe. Um, uh, I'd, I'd also like to offer a quick round of applause to our new team member. Uh, if you've been on some of our webinars, you, you probably haven't seen Dan before. Uh, he's joined us as uh, our chief t-shirt officer. Just stand up, Dan, tell, show us why. Uh, I've got a sweatshirt on right now. It's a good one, though. There you go. I, I, you should have warned me. I could have, could have, could have given you Danger Mouse, but I'm, uh, there's, I'm, I'm... there's always something interesting on Dan's chest, and, uh, and we love it. Uh, but Joe, thank you very much for for the session. Um, uh, as ever, uh, it's it's always fun having you on. I always learn a bunch of stuff whenever we talk, uh, and thank you for sharing it with with everybody. Um, to the audience, thank you all for turning up. Um, do reach out to Joe directly, uh, or reach out to us if you have any any other questions. And we do have, a, uh, you know, basically we're running a couple of webinars a month at this point. Uh, so if you've enjoyed this one, check out the, the other webinars that we've got coming up. Uh, you can find them on our, on our website. Great, awesome. thank you everybody. And uh, Joe, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, everybody tune in, Project Management Office Hours with Stuart in April, it's gonna be another good time. Cool, thank you guys. Bye everyone. <laughs>